So most of you are not in school. However, <laughs> we are at that season of the year where final exams are starting to take place. In fact, in college, most of them have already occurred. Are you actually done done? June 24th. And that comes after June 24th? Okay, so Paul, Paul is getting ready to be a um, nurse practitioner, and he's um, getting ready to graduate June 24th. And, and, and then the big exam he's saying is after that. <laughs> That's, I'm sharing, repeating this because uh, this also goes on the internet in our message uh, that goes on there. So just so that people know. Uh, but exams are at that time of the year, right? Th this is the time of the year that even those of us who have been long time out of school, there's still come up some of that feeling, isn't there? Like, okay, is it test time? Are you ready for your test? <laughs> it, it, th we are in a time of evaluations. Uh, and that's what happens at, at school. In fact, doesn't that happen when you go to the doctor? It's an evaluation that takes place there. Um, it, it happens at work all the time. <laughs> uh, just this morning, we were having internet issues, and so I had to call into a Spectrum, and at the end of the phone call, what do they want me to do? They want me to evaluate the person I spoke with. It always frustrates me that I don't get to evaluate spectrum when I call in like that. <laughs> they are intentional in that, in that are not allowing me to make my other evaluations. <laughs> it's usually where I start with the, with the spectrum person when I'm calling in. Do you really feel excited that I'm so upset right now that I'm impatient and I'm going to be unkind with you? Doesn't that make you feel good that I'm getting to talk to you at this point in the journey? <laughs> no, it doesn't, they say usually. <laughs> But that's what they're there for. And they say, you know, you can uh, bypass all those other things. I say, yeah, I try. <laughs> Evaluations. In fact, I, I have a letter over there that's a, that's a letter from um, Transformation Ministries, and they want us evaluating the church and how we have done in the last year. And there's several different questions that we're supposed to answer evaluating the church for Transformation Ministries. And Evaluating Transformation Ministries, our missions agency that we work with, that we tie together with. Uh, that's a, a group of probably, what is it now, 160 churches that are trying to serve Jesus Christ. They're actually planting more churches. Did you know that right now you have helped plant 29 churches this last year? Wow. 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 Uh, several of them are in uh, Tijuana. There's actually one in southern Florida that you help plan. Another one in Indiana, in Texas. Uh, it's interesting, Transformation Ministries is spreading out across the land. It's not just in Southern California. And that's what happens as we're part of a larger family. And so they're wanting to evaluate their ministry and our ministry. The fact is, is that every Sunday you evaluate me, right? <laughs> Every Sunday you do. <laughs> Let's be honest about it, okay? <laughs> You're evaluating already. I'm not going to listen today. He's talking about evaluations. He's already bored me, all right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're going through that process of evaluating. Is this a message that's going to reach me or not? Oh, my goodness, the young people. Yeah, oh, boring pastor today. You know, no, no, we don't want to listen to this. I mean, it's happening all the time. Every, and, and the fact is, it's not just young people that are evaluating. Every single person in here is evaluating. You've evaluated the music as you've gone along this morning. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you've been doing, right? You evaluated the room when you came in. Does it feel comfortable? Is Pastor Bill going to move me to the front row when I want to sit in the back row? I mean, you, you've been evaluating all, the, all through the process. And, and we as a church need to do, do some evaluation. In fact, God himself is evaluating us. I remember it's been now several years ago when I had my first treadmill. I've had now, I think it's three or four since that. The first one, I only lasted a minute. Not because I wasn't able to. I was like, you know, what are you stopping this for? I can still keep going. Come on. But, but they were seeing some pretty serious things in my heart. Since then, I've completed every treadmill that I've done. Uh, I can go up the incline. I can do it at speed, uh, whatever they do. And, and I don't have any issues. Um, 
Well, there was one time they thought there was something else going on, so I got to do then another angiogram, you know, the heart catheterization. I think I've had three of those, uh, maybe four. Uh, heart catheterizations where they go all the way into your heart uh, and look around inside the heart like they're going to do with Stephen tomorrow. Uh, it, and, and through the, those exams, those are evaluations, aren't they? They're evaluating your heart and, and on that and with the treadmill. They're evaluating things about your body. Evaluations are not bad, are they? The evaluation of God is what matters most to us. Not the evaluation of what others think of us, though all of us fall prey to that a little bit. Is my hair combed straight enough today? Oh, no. Can you see the cord behind me? Is my shirt tucked in? Or should it be tucked out? Oh, I don't know. I'm, which, which is right culturally again? On the mountain, I, I guess I shouldn't be wearing slacks. I should have jeans. I mean, you go into all those things, right? Come on. Yeah, everybody does some kind of evaluations and thinking about what other people think. But the bottom line is what matters most is, is what does God think? Today we're going to learn that God has his own treadmill, that God is evaluating our hearts, our spiritual heart, our soul, and how we are following him. God's putting that evaluation on us. So how many of you have had a treadmill? Oh, wow. Uh, that's telling something about our age too, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> Those of us, we've, all, we've had treadmills. We've, we've gone on there. And what was the purpose? Again, to evaluate how your heart was doing. In fact, I can't pass this moment, but we've got to stop and pray for Stephen. Um, the Russell's grandson, who is going to be having a heart catheterization tomorrow, uh, and the challenge is, is that the last time he had one, he was born with half a heart. He has a lot of heart issues. He's had multiple surgeries already. He has multiple other surgeries ahead. And at some point when he's 19 or so, he'll have to have a heart transplant well tomorrow and the last I should say the last time that they did the heart catheterization his heart stopped once that has happened during a catheterization you're vulnerable to it happening again and so um, while the the family uh, the his parents um, um, Joe and Kim the, well, they, they know Jesus. They know that God's carrying them. They know that he's a blessing. The one that broke my heart was uh, this couple weeks ago. When, um, is this legal for me to say? Okay. When, when Kim said, um, I'm, these last two weeks, she's been looking at it. And what if this is the last time I see our son? The last time we do these things with him. And that's not quite an exact quote, but I think it gets the point. Uh, and, and, but she, she knows Jesus. She knows Jesus is there with her. But she's also been looking, what if this is the last days that I get to see our little boy? Let's pray for Stephen. Father God, thank you. I thank you are the God of miracles. Just like we've prayed for that miracle for Kim. Lord, we pray for your miracle for little Stephen. Thank you, Lord, for the fun he's already had, for the things that he's been able to do. Thank you for parents who trust you, who, who know that their son is in your hands, who hope this is not the last days that they see him. And Jesus, we pray that you will give Stephen extra, extra protection during that catheterization tomorrow. And Jesus, our prayer is that he, this would not be the last days that they have with their son, but that, Lord, that you will give them many more. And I thank you, God, that they do not go into that room tomorrow, that Stephen doesn't go in there alone. And he's not just with doctors and nurses, but that the great physician is there with him. And, God, you've already given him life in a miraculous kind of way. And we thank you for that. And we pray your special touch on him. In Jesus' name, amen. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. The apostles have been talking about Jesus Christ. Paul, Silas, Timothy 
have been traveling the countryside, and wherever they go, they're telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, that he is alive, that he has power, and that all who believe in him will be saved. And he's going, they've been simply repeating that. Some people don't like that message. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. <laughs> I want you to think about what keeps you from talking to a friend, relative, co-worker about Jesus Christ. What keeps you from inviting a neighbor over to your house for you to get to know them, uh, to have dinner with them, just to befriend them, and, all, and, and eventually, what keeps you from telling them about Jesus Christ? What keeps you from talking about Jesus Christ with somebody who you're pretty confident is opposed to Christianity? What is it that, that hinders you? What is it that, that blocks you? And, uh, and is, it, is it fear? Is it fear of not having the right answers? Is it fear of not knowing how to, quote, convince them? Is it fear that they're going to simply reject you? Uh, is, is that what's hindering you? Because if you think about it, Whatever it is that's hindering you has something to do with you want to please that person. Or let me say it the opposite way. You don't want to displease them. You don't want to, quote, get them upset, cause them to reject you, cause them to say no. I mean, think about it. Have you ever invited somebody to church? What, what kept you from inviting them? And what keeps you from inviting them again? What keeps you from inviting people into a small group to, alongside of you? What keeps you from praying with people in public? Well, what will people say? How will they react? And, and, and I've heard it. Uh, one, one of my friends is, who I've really encouraged, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're sharing a hardship with you, stop and pray with them right there. Uh, folks, it's the best thing you can do. And don't just say, well, I'm going to pray for you. you know, that's really nice that you make that statement. And it's even better if you actually go home and do it, which oftentimes doesn't happen, let's be honest, right? Yeah, yeah we ought to show, up, uh, show our hands. How many times have you said you'll pray for somebody and you didn't? <laughs> You don't need to, <laughs> but, but, but think about it. We, we oftentimes do that, and some, sometimes it's just because we forgot, but it just, it just slipped our mind. The best time to pray for somebody is when they share a concern with you. But how many times have you been in this situation, you may be even hearing you in the background, you hear, Pastor Bill's standing right here behind me saying, pray with them, and I don't know. And, well, I don't know how they'll take it, right? I, I, I don't know if they'll like it. I don't know if they'll say yes. I don't know if they're going to be embarrassed. I don't know if somebody's going to come behind us and, you know, going to listen in. Uh, you know, it's going to look kind of weird doing that right here in the middle of the post office, right? Uh, why is that so weird to pray in the middle of the post office? People take dogs into the post office. Can't we pray with people in the post office? <laughs> you see, best things we can do, and my, my, my friend says, you know, well, I've always just been kind of, kind of concerned with how they'll react, which means, bottom line, what is it that keeps us from praying? We're concerned with pleasing that other person. No, no, I'm sorry, you're, you're going to not like me for this one, right? But, but our challenge is we're trying to please people instead of pleasing whom? God. You evaluate yourself on that one. Are you pleasing people or are you pleasing God? 
Paul says, uh, you, know, you know what we've been through. We were beat and treated outrageously at Philippi. Oh, man. And in fact, look what they were done. They were stripped. They took rods and beat them and then threw them into jail. And Paul and Silas, while they're in jail, having been just ter terribly mistreated, guess what happens? Remember the rest of the story? They're singing hymns. I, I'm sure they're in too much pain to sleep. <laughs> Not, I don't know, but they're singing hymns in the middle of the night, and what happens? The doors open up to all of the, all of the prison cells. <laughs> all these gates that are locked with little chains and stuff, like every single one of the chains falls off and every door opens. The jailer comes in, hears all this noise, and like, oh no! And he gets ready, he's about to kill himself because he knows that with all the doors open, the prisoners have obviously left. I mean, if you're a prisoner and the, guard, the door opens in the middle of the night, wouldn't you leave? Well, you'd be silly not to, folks. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the chains are open, and, and he's a oh, great. Prisoners are gone. If the prisoners have broken out, what's going to happen to the prison guard? He's gone. He's dead. So he's about to fall on his sword himself, and Paul says, stop, wait, no, don't do it. We're all here. That's a miracle in itself. You know, all these doors open, nobody left. <laughs> And so he sits down and talks with, the, jail, the jailer talks with Paul and Silas, and that night he washes their wounds and he says, now please baptize me. And he and his household, here in the middle of the night, they commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And then the next day, they, they, they want to, <laughs> the, the magistrates, the, the leaders of the city are like, they, okay, we, we want him to come so we can send him away. And, and Paul says, we're not leaving because we're Roman citizens and you shouldn't have beat us. Now they're really concerned. <laughs> so, they, so they send back, okay, look, tell him just to go. They, no, tell them to come to us and set us free because they mistreated us. So they come. They take Paul inside and they say, and they beg them, please leave. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry. We, we didn't know you were Roman citizens, but please leave. Yes, they were bruised, beaten with rods, mistreated, and they leave town right after that. <clears throat> he says, you know what we went through. Because we left Philippi, and where did they go next? They came to Thessalonica. But he goes on and it says that, that, that we faced strong, we faced strong, that we faced strong, that we faced strong, Acts 17 describes it this way. But other Jews were jealous. <laughs> Interesting statement, isn't it? So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Watch out when you start a riot. They're hard to control. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. Uh, they wanted to do more than just greet them or hear them talk. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and guess what they started doing? Preaching the gospel again. Paul, one would say, never learns <laughs> the trouble that follows him when he preaches the gospel. Verse 3 says, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Paul says, look, we came here and we suffered for you. We get, ran into opposition right away, didn't we? In fact, it, the interesting thing is, Paul's only in Thessalonica for three Sundays. Excuse me, three Sabbaths. He's only there for three Sabbaths. And at, at, by the end of the third Sabbath, they're already running him out of town, out of Thessalonica. That's how quick these people, some of them became believers. That's how young they are in the faith. Three weeks old. Think about you being a three-week-old Christian. At best, maybe it was just last Sabbath that you accepted Christ, and now you're already being arrested, facing opposition yourself simply because you made a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. That's what the Thessalon Thessalonian church is going through. And Paul says, look, we, we did this, when we preached to you, we didn't 
stopped you out of error. We didn't have impure motives. We weren't trying to get rich off of you as some people come trying to, to talk and, and just become famous themselves. We weren't trying to trick you in any way. We simply straightforward told you the truth. Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, paid the price for our sin. He's coming again. Do you want to believe in him or not? Your sins can be forgiven. You can be a new person in Jesus Christ simply because of what Jesus Christ did for you. John MacArthur said, when you look for a church, don't ask how good is their music, how good is their children's program. Don't ask how clever is their preacher, how interesting is he. Ask this, how well do they guard the truth? How well do they take care of the treasure of truth? And what is the truth? The word of God. How well do they take care of the truth about Jesus Christ? Does your church teach about Jesus with unashamed commitment? Thessalonians says they spoke because God had sent them. Why did Paul go to Philippi? Not because he wanted to get beat. Why does he go to Thessalonica? Not because he wants to get run out of town. Why does he go on to Berea? Because he's on a mission sent by God, sent by two people who don't know him. And he is going to take it as far as God wants him to go. His mission is to tell people about Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please God, please people, but God who tests our hearts. Every single person here has a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, an acquaintance that does not know Jesus Christ. Every one of us does. For some of us, that person is much closer. They may be a brother, a sister, son, or daughter, mother, father, grandson, grandfather. But there's somebody that we know who does not know Jesus Christ. And for that person, we may be the only connection they have to coming to know Jesus Christ. And every single one of us, like Paul, is compelled. Don't we have that desire? for every person we know to know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them, and for them to come to belief in that same love of Jesus Christ. You see, the Paul, the Paul said, we, we were compelled. We, we had to talk about Jesus. Why? Because we saw him risen from the dead. We saw him alive again. We experienced the power of him working in our life, and we had to tell people about Jesus. And we have a similar compulsion, don't we? What does Matthew 28 say? Jesus speaking to the disciples. He's ascending into heaven, and he looks at uh, them and really at all of us. And what are we supposed to do? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. We have that same compulsion. First Timothy says it this way. I thank Christ our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointed me to his service. Even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What's Paul saying? Look, I'm a different man because Jesus came into my life. I used to, I, I blasphemed against God. I, I fought against Jesus. I killed Christians. I should not have a chance to know God at all. Instead, he was m merciful to me. And because God was for merciful to me, I have to tell other people, what about you? Do you feel, feel that compulsion? That Jesus has changed your life. Jesus has blessed you with love and forgiveness. And has that compelled you to tell somebody else about Jesus? Paul goes on, he says, their goal, his goal was not to please people, but to please God. And there's, I think, our biggest challenge. I think that we are more vulnerable to falling into trying to please people instead of pleasing God. 
How often do we hold back from witnessing or, or just serving somebody who's not a believer or praying with somebody because we don't want them to reject us? We, we're concerned with their reaction or the reaction of other people around them, so we back up, we hold back, we don't talk. You see, Paul never backed down from preaching about Jesus Christ no matter what the reaction was going to be, he said, I'm, I'm not going to back down. And why? Because for me, the most important thing is for people to know Jesus, and secondly, is for me to use my life to glorify God. That's Paul's goal. Just, I want to please God. I want to glorify God. How many of us have heard that statement that when we get to heaven, what do we want to hear from Jesus? Welcome home, good and faithful servant. Is do you really want that? Do you really want him to say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. You, you've served me in all these different places. Paul, you served me in Philippi. You served me in Thessalonica. You served me in Berea. Ultimately, you even served me in Rome. You served me back in Jerusalem. You served me all across the known land. And you did that with beatings and shipwreck and torture and stonings. And you were persecuted again and again. And people constantly rejected you. And, and, and yet, you kept serving me. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. Now, what, was it, what would God say to you? Why should God say to you, welcome home, good and faithful servant? What are those things that you would say, this is what I've been doing to please God, not to please me. Think about it. What's that list that you want Jesus to read off in heaven? This is, this is where you served me. This is how you blessed me. This is what you did for me. And, and welcome, good and faithful servant. Are we more concerned about what people think than what God thinks? <clears throat> Again, a pastor said, I don't come as pleasing men. I wasn't commissioned by men. I don't preach the gospel of men. I was commissioned by God. I preach the gospel of God. I do not preach it to please men. And I should warn you, the gospel of God will upset men. It, it, it will upset people. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. How do you handle the word of God in your life? They didn't look for praise from people. And here's our challenge. And some of the words that Paul's using here, he's saying, we're not going to change the message just because people don't like it. Because what could... What could Paul have done? Okay, well, you don't want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, then just believe that he was a good teacher. Just believe that he was a good man, that, that he even you know, did miracles and stuff, and, and how incredible that was. Oh, you don't want to accept that he was the Son of God? Okay, well, again, just, just believe he was really better than everybody else, and, and he died on a cross. You don't want to believe he rose from the dead? Okay, well then don't, but can you imagine Paul saying those things? And, and, and what are we tempted to leave out when showing the love of Christ and trying to help somebody know the truth of Jesus Christ? Paul says, I'm not looking for praise. I'm looking for the examination of God. Says, Paul preached for one purpose, to receive and experience the glory of God the Father. For others to experience that. Guzik says, Paul didn't seek glory from men because his needs for security and acceptance were met primarily how? In Jesus Christ. This meant that he didn't spend his life trying to seek and earn the acceptance of man. He ministered from an understanding of his identity in Jesus Christ. 
2 Timothy 2, excuse me, 4 says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing in his kingdom. I give you this charge. Was this just to Timothy? Just to young preachers? I don't think so. What's a preacher? A person who proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. So therefore, what does that make all of us if we're proclaiming good news? Makes us all preachers, right? I know we've kind of given that, that name preacher, don't preach at me, right? We, we've used this phrase in kind of a negative connotation. But, but the, a preacher is one who tells good news to other people about Jesus Christ. We have this great news that Jesus loves us and that Jesus loves the person next to you. And that's what we're supposed to be sharing. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. That means get ready anytime. If somebody says, why are you smiling? Why do you go to church? Why do you worship? Why do you believe in Jesus? Be prepared to, to preach good news to them. Now notice this. Watch out because there's some other pieces here. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Don't be afraid to say to somebody, hey, that's bad for you. That's harming you. Or, or look here. Oh, God wants to make a difference in your life. Be prepared to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Don't just get ticked off at people. You don't like the way somebody's driving? Be patient with them, right? <laughs> For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep, you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. People are going to say there's all kinds of ways that you can get to know God. There's all kinds of gods out there. Jesus is just one of them. There's all kinds of ways to heaven. He's just one of many. And they are myths. And we have to teach the truth. Finally, Paul knew that as he was going through life, that God was testing his heart. God was looking at Paul's heart to see what was in it, like God is looking at ours. Verse 5, you know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. We didn't do this to get rich. We didn't do this to get your praise. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. We could have done things to cause you to be impressed with us, but we had a different goal, and that goal was to point you to Jesus Christ. And God's looking at our hearts too today, isn't he? Last week, almost every single person at worship stood up at the end of the